Hello, and welcome to Laurel TV's Health Watch. I'm Dr. Trudy Hall, Vice President of Medical Affairs for Laurel Regional Hospital, your community hospital. Today's Health Watch topics focus on the upcoming holiday season and ways we can stay healthy and happy during this time. As we all know, the holidays are a busy time of family gatherings, great meals, and exchanging gifts with loved ones. But the holidays can also be a time of overwhelming stress and anxiety for many people. More importantly, not dealing with that stress can have a negative impact on your health. I recently spoke with Dr. Harvey Rapp, clinical psychologist at Laurel Regional Hospital, on ways to identify what triggers our stress and how to cope with those triggers. Well, you know, stress can bring out an awful lot of uh, symptoms and we want to avoid having those kinds of problems as, as the holiday um, comes up and, and, uh, and, and we plan for everything going on. First, I have to identify the source. I would want everyone, um, including yourself, to write down yes. what are the sources of the stress. It would be a, a very good idea to do that because uh, you can sit down with, with, your, with your spouse, uh, with your children, or or with, with a good friend and write down what the sources might be. That's the first step. And then uh, after you've identified what the, what the stresses are, then you can begin a plan of action. The American Psychological Association shows that more than half of us are stressed during the holiday season over feeling that we don't have enough time or enough money. Added to this are the pressures and the need to give or receive holiday gifts. Well, you know, money is probably the number one source of stress, mm -hmm. particularly uh, in, in uh, not just in holiday time, but right. uh, all, all the time. Mm -hmm. I know that my wife and I sit down, we make up a list of people that we want to uh, uh, send gifts to, and we uh, decide pretty much how much we're going to spend on, uh, for each person. And, and overall, this way we gain a little more control over what we're doing. Another unwelcome condition that could come during the holiday is depression. Particularly if you're spending the holidays away from your family or friends, or if you've recently lost a loved one. The holidays can leave us feeling sad and alone. Depression, again, is a, is a, uh, um, a, a result of the um, of the stress that you're experiencing. Um, what you can do is to, is to find ways to, uh, to bring happiness into your life. Um, talking to a friend, uh, talking to uh, your, your, uh, your pastor or your rabbi or somebody that uh, is going to be sympathetic to the situation that, that you're experiencing. Uh, in, in extreme cases, you would talk to a, a professional, a social worker, or a psychologist, or a psychiatrist. Um, That's true. And as, uh, but we, we also have to think about taking care of ourselves as well as taking care of other people. Exactly. So uh, we don't want to forget the fact that we have our needs as well. And not that we need to, to get a, a very expensive gift, but we need to take time out uh, for relaxation, for uh, uh, fun things that we can do to, to make our lives a little more balanced. So let's review some ways to alleviate stress during the holiday season. First, identify your triggers. What stresses you out during the holidays? Next, what can you do to create a less stressful holiday? Manage your time. Share the burden of holiday cooking, errands and shopping with family, members, and friends. And finally, set a budget for how much you want to spend on the holiday entertaining, traveling, and gift giving. And then the hard part is stick to your plan. Next, let's take a look at holiday gatherings and all that tempting food. Many of us are looking forward to sharing the over-the-top meal with family and friends but we need to find a balance between having a good time and not tipping the scales. Statistics vary on the amount of weight the average American gains during the holiday season. 
There are reports of anywhere from 1 to 10 pounds, but regardless of how much weight you gain, the fact is that most people won't lose that amount, no matter how small. We all know the New Year's resolution to lose weight rarely happens. That means it's important to factor in those added calories in your holiday dining plans. And it's especially important for people who have health risks, for example, diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. Brandy Suarez is a nutritionist with Laurel Regional Hospital. It's estimated that many people will gain five pounds over the holiday season. But there are still ways to enjoy those favorite holiday dishes while making healthier choices. I think a really important part is to kind of go into the entire season knowing that food is a part of family and enjoyment um, and to not set difficult expectations for ourselves to know that we can still enjoy holiday favorites, traditional meals that we like, um, but maybe just to cut back a little bit, take small steps to control portions, making sure we're staying active, um, even if it's even if the weather is changing, we can still go on walks with family members during holidays, and we can still do more activities um, along with enjoying food and being together with other people. Um, there's also, I think, a lot of ways to maybe change recipes that we're familiar with, that we enjoy, um, cutting down on added butters, added salts, and trying to cook more with herbs and spices, and just be creative with recipes and trying some new, some new things as well. As I mentioned, navigating the holiday dining table can be particularly problematic for those who are already at risk for diabetes, high blood pressure, and other diseases. When we come back, we'll talk with a diabetic education expert on how those at risk can have a healthy and happy holiday dining experience. Laurel, Maryland's outdoor pleasures can be found in its acres of parkland or on a lake. This is my Laurel. Where a legacy of service to others rises from the ashes of a downtown fire and sparks a renewed sense of community. This is my Laurel. Where the people and the leaders work together for progress. This is my Laurel. For all things Laurel, tune in to Laurel TV. Turn your power on. Communication is key and knowledge is power. Laurel TV is your opportunity for both. I'm Communications Director Audrey Barnes. It's a new day at Laurel TV. You'll still see city government at work, but we're adding new programs and breathing new life into your local public access television station. And we want you to be a part of this exciting transformation. Tell us what's going on in your neighborhood, the schools, the businesses. Have a show idea? Let us train you to make your program a reality. You can even borrow our gear to do it. Let's make Laurel TV the place for education, entertainment, and information. Laurel TV, turn your power on. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Trudy Hall. Joining me now is Sharon Bratcher, dietitian and diabetic educator expert at Laurel Regional Hospital. Sharon, thanks for being here today. What do you think are the biggest food landmines for at-risk people during the holidays? And can you give us some tips of how to stay healthy and still have a good time? Well, one of the big landmines is just the abundance of food. And another thing is that a lot of times in many cultures, the way we express love is through eating together and sharing together. So we really have to kind of plan ahead one thing I do suggest many times is that you bring a healthy meal. Uh, if you're a person with diabetes, you're learning about meal planning. So bring something that's low in calories, uh, something that's low fat, something low in sodium, and share it with your family. So what about the typical holiday meals and a typical holiday food, the 
mashed potatoes, the macaroni and cheese, everything that's fried and buttered down. So how do, how do, you, how do you manage to um, navigate your meal and still stay healthy? Well, one thing you want to think about is picking choices that are baked that will be better, eating lean protein, like the white of meat of the turkey, removing the skin, and you can have some of those carbs, but in small portions, maybe something like two tablespoons, a little sample. That's a really good way. Good. Also, if we know we're gonna be indulging in a big meal, should we skip breakfast in anticipation of feasting later on in the afternoon? Or is it better to save up our calories, or is it better to pulse those calories throughout the day? Well, we never want you to mix breakfast. We think about breakfast as breaking the fast. And so we do want you to have breakfast, but maybe it's going to be a lighter breakfast than what you're going to normally have on a day. So we know that you're going to be eating more calories, so just space it throughout the day. And, you know, we want to keep blood sugars level. Okay. So how about alcohol? So usually there's a meal, you know, people have a glass of wine or any other kind of mixed beverages. What are some tips about drinking? Well, you can drink alcohol. It's not restricted. You do want to talk to your doctor, though, about certain medications, like metformin is a good example. He might want you to limit alcohol to maybe just once or twice a week, so you want to have that discussion with the doctor. But some good tips are mixing that red wine with a little club soda or seltzer. You want to stay away from tonic water because it has a lot of calories, almost as many calories as a soda. You want to stay away from the cocktails that have a lot of added sugars or things to sweeten them. What about cardiac disease, um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol? What are some foods that pay, probably people should stay away from at the table or at least limit how or change how they cook? So what are some tips on that? Well, we definitely don't want to add salt. That's something we don't want to do. You can think about adding things like some herbs or salt-free seasonings like McCormick uh, seasonings that have the green cap. They're usually salt-free. Using things like dill and garlic, things you might not normally use, also, cooking with olive oil and canola oil, these are things that reduce the fat, um, eliminating things like smoked meat. Smoked meat has a lot of, lot of salt. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So, uh, I know we have uh, diabetic education classes at Laurel Regional Hospital, and we're so happy that you're there leading the classes. Tell us a little bit about uh, the kind of patients that you see, and also, you and I both know, physicians' offices do not have that time to be able to do the education um, regarding diabetes or even just healthy eating. So, what do you offer there at Laurel, and tell us a little bit about these classes. Well, we have these classes here at Laurel for persons who were recently diagnosed with diabetes, and we really want to address their needs. We want to ask the questions about what they're confused about, what would help them, but our main goal is to help a person with diabetes to know their numbers. That's really important. Mm -hmm. So when you speak about numbers, what does that mean? Well, we want you to know a, a A1C level, and we want you to know your blood pressure, and we want you to know cholesterol. How many people out there know what an A1C is? Please tell them. Well, what an A1C is, is a test that we get done every 12 weeks. Think of it like a report card for a person with diabetes. We want to get a score of A, and a score of A would mean that your A1C is less than 7%. So it's usually done at the doctor's office, the testing? It can be done at the doctor's office at point of care, but many times we send you out to a lab to have that done. And it gives an average of what's been going on with your diabetes and to let us know if it's well controlled. I really like this. So this kind of organizes a little bit of the decisions that people have to face um, regarding making healthy food choices. So tell me a little bit about your, your sample plate here. Well, this is a typical meal plan for a person with diabetes and someone without diabetes. We all should be eating similar foods. So what we want is half of your plate with those non-starchy vegetables, things like tomatoes and Brussels sprouts and asparagus, spinach, peppers, things that will help fill you up, full of fiber. Then the other half of that plate we divide into quarters, and you can have starch. Starches with skin is best. And we also want you to moderate brown rice, barley, those type of things, whole grains. That other quarter is lean protein, things like turkey and fish, um, lean cuts of, of beef. You could also use something like beans, 
high fiber, and you get proteins. Now on this particular plate, or in this meal, you notice we took away something that a lot of times we see. Uh, well, it's a part of our meals. We've changed that cake or dessert to fruit. And it's still giving you the satisfaction of having something sweet, but it's a healthier choice. Right, this is very helpful. So not have half of your plate filled with macaroni and cheese or something really fattening, but actually making those portions and making sure it counts. Um, what, how does exercise play into maintaining um, blood sugar and also um, cardiac disease, maintaining good blood pressure? Exercise is essential. It's something we really need to have. It should be a part of anyone's uh, regimen, persons who have diabetes, but of course those without, but particularly persons with diabetes. We recommend 30 minutes, five days a week. So that's 150 minutes. And if you're just starting, you don't have to do 30 minutes all at once. You can do 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening. Take those small steps. We know exercise also reduces stress. So it's something you really want to incorporate into your lifestyle. So have you ever seen any patient, if they made smart choices and also incorporated a good exercise diet plan, can they ever get off of diabetic medications? Yes, I have seen some persons with diabetes who are able to get off of medications. But diabetes is very individualized. We're all different. So I wouldn't want you to be discouraged if you made meal plan choices that were more healthy and you exercised and you weren't able to get off of medications. So we do see it but it's very individualized. So eating healthy in these lifestyle changes is not just a, also an individual problem, but is also setting good examples for the family in making some good choices. Tell us a little bit about you know, how diabetes can run the families and how setting up these principles early in life um, can actually help with your family in the long run. Well, one thing, like you said, diabetes definitely runs in families. And so we want to set good examples. And some people think that a person with diabetes eats a different meal right. than those without. We all should be eating a similar meal plan as what we showed earlier. And like you said, because it runs in families, we want to model good behaviors right. for our children. Right. What would be some really good tips about willpower around managing, you know, eating too much or overindulging? Well, one thing we do recommend is that that meal should last about 20 minutes. When you sit down, eat slowly. Enjoy the food. Uh, make sure that you're giving your stomach time to tell the brain that I've had enough. One other thing is that many times we eat to feel full. And what you really want to do is eat to take away the sense of hunger. Okay. And so reframing how you think about that. Well, I want to thank you, Sharon, for the great tips um, that you've given us around ho healthy holiday eating, also regarding diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And again, I hope this will be something that we will go into the season and the people of Laurel will actually say, we want to make sure we get through this at a much healthier point after the holidays. Thank you. It was a pleasure being here. Up next, some of us might still have some Halloween candy lying around the house as we head into the holiday season. We'll talk to some experts on pediatric dental health and how to let the little ones have a good time without compromising their good health. Laurel, Maryland's outdoor pleasures can be found in its acres of parkland or on a lake. This is my Laurel. Where a legacy of service to others rises from the ashes of a downtown fire and sparks a renewed sense of community. This is my world. Where the people and the leaders work together for progress. This is my world. For all things Laurel, tune in to Laurel TV. Turn your power on. Communication is key and knowledge is power. Laurel TV is your opportunity for both. I'm Communications Director Audrey Barnes. It's a new day at Laurel TV. You'll still see city government at work, but we're adding new programs and breathing new life into your local public access television station. And we want you to be a part of this exciting transformation. Tell us what's going on in your neighborhood, the schools, the businesses. Have a show idea? Let us train you to make your program a reality. You can even borrow our gear to do it. 
Let's make Laurel TV the place for education, entertainment, and information. Laurel TV, turn your power on. It seems we just wrapped up Halloween and now we're heading full force into Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Hanukkah season. It's not just adults who overindulge this time of year, but also our children. I've just hidden all of my daughter's Halloween candy so that she doesn't have any more before the holidays. And just as unhealthy eating habits can have a negative impact on adults, they can also be detrimental to children, particularly when it comes to their dental health. The American Journal of Pediatric Dentistry says many oral health problems can be prevented if parents take good care of their children's teeth and gums. So before you let your child unwrap another piece of leftover Halloween candy, let's hear what Dr. Jerry Casper, head of children's dentistry and orthodontics practice, has to say about pediatric dental health. Well, basically, the role of a pediatric dentist is um, to educate and um, be able to supply a dental home for our youngest children. Um, dental disease is the, num it's the number one chronic disease in children, even more so than asthma. And these kids are just not being screened out and treated. So part of our profession is to um, educate the pediatric, other pediatric professionals, the pediatricians, the pediatric nurses, the Head Start uh, teachers and nurses, to be able to identify children that are greatest at risk. So let's establish a difference between a pediatric dentist and a family dentist. A pediatric dentist has two to three years of additional training after completing dental school. Their offices are geared towards making young patients feel more comfortable, and relax while visiting the dentist and starting on the right path to good dental health. We like to see children at one year of age and the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics along with the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry recommends that. But most importantly, as long as we can get the children that are at most need, the children that are at highest risk to get there by that age, that's the most important thing to us because we realize at this point, not everyone will get to us by one year of age. So that's why it's so important to be able to educate and work with the other health professionals. More importantly, pediatric dentists can identify abnormalities in children's oral care that might also impact other areas of their health. Like family dentists, pediatric dentists are often the first medical experts to diagnose oral cancer, diabetes, sleep apnea, and other breathing problems. Okay. Identifying these problems can help children receive the proper treatment and get back on the track to good health in being successful in school. Untreated dental problems can cause other health problems and even death, as evidenced by a well-publicized case right here in Prince George's County when a young boy died after failing to get proper dental care for a tooth abscess. Such cases are rare, but they illustrate the importance of children receiving early dental care and treatment. One of the most important things we can do for our children is to make sure they eat a balanced diet while making sure to limit sugars and other simple carbohydrates that wreak havoc on dental health. Well, nobody will listen to me if I say never to have sugars and sweets, but the main thing is don't snack all day long on sweets because it's the number of exposures to, uh, um, of the sugars to the teeth. So I tell the parents at Halloween, take the candy, let the kids eat as much as they want, and then get rid of it. Okay. Don't keep having one piece here and then another minute because that will set the environment, the oral environment, to be more conducive to dental disease and dental caries. So I say to avoid the, the sugary snacks that are most retentive, and um, nowadays, with the advent of the fruit roll-ups, fruit snacks, right. and all these, quote, healthy, healthy, yeah. healthy snacks, yeah. they're not so healthy, right. anything with sugar. So basically, avoid the sticky snacks. And also, as far as drinks go, 
stick with water or milk between meals. With meals, juices are okay, but juice is sugar, and even if you water it down, it's still sugar. Also, setting a bad example will lead to dental problems for children. It affects their, their whole development. Um, their, these infections, you know, can be life-threatening, and you know, uh, you don't think of dental disease as life-threatening, but it truly is. So the studies show that that kids lose days at school, and they can't function well at school. They can't eat well, so their diet is bad. Nutrition goes down, and they're like I said, it is the most chronic. It's the number one most chronic disease in children. Of course, good dental health is not just important for children but for adults as well. Fortunately, the state of Maryland recently recognized the need to provide better access to dental care for Maryland residents. The state increased its Medicaid budget to enable more dentists to receive reimbursements for treating low-income patients, including children and pregnant women. Medicaid patients um, get, um, get have a lower reimbursement rate, so right. if, if I, if I take mainly Medicaid um, patients, my reimbursement rate is significantly lower. Um, the state has looked at that and they have significantly tried to get a higher reimbursement rate. Higher reimbursement rate would mean that more doctors, more, more providers would not want to take these patients. We're fortunate to have the president of the Maryland Board of Dental Examiners right here in Laurel. I spoke with Dr. Maurice Miles at his Laurel Lakes Cosmetic Dentistry Office about the board's commitment to provide better access to dental care for all residents and especially children. So if you are African American, if you're of African descent and you're within the state of Maryland, you're 42 percent more likely to have um, dental decay, oral health problems. So there's still a disparity in numbers in terms of race. Uh, children are at a higher risk for decay, caries, and um, oral health problems. Um, just think of, just think of a, a child as a, as a grown adult. And so if the foundation isn't laid from, from the get-go, we're going to have an adult that has lung problems. And we already know that um, oral health is linked to diabetes, hypertension, um, cardiovascular disease. And so getting a good oral health um, basis for any child is going to be paramount to their healthy adulthood. Well, that's it for this edition of Health Watch. I'm Dr. Trudy Hall. Until next time, stay healthy and have positive thoughts of wellness.